Hello, Fast Fam. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Craig Lieberman, and I've been tinkering on cars since 1980. I've owned more than 40 cars in my life. Some were heroes, some were zeros. But never in my wildest dreams would I ever guess that three of my cars would go on to star in a motion picture franchise. My Supra, my GTR, and my Maxima all had starring roles in Universal's Fast and Furious movies. Over the next three years, I'd serve Universal as a technical advisor. I helped choose the cars, procure the parts, oversee their build, and support both production and post-production. I've got some great stories to tell, and that's why I created this channel. I hope you like the video. This is a video that I've been meaning to do for a very long time. Among the questions I receive, this one has to be among the most frequently asked. The question to which I'm re referring, of course, is any variation of the what engine did they use to make the sound for the car, for this car in the movie? I'm going to focus on the first two movies because I have more first-hand knowledge of these films. And since I wasn't on a uh, set or, pa or part of the post-production process for any of the other movies, I can only speak intelligently about what I know and what I witnessed. I think the most common misconception people have about the car sounds is that we simply just recorded the cars, the actual cars that were on set, and used those recordings in the final edit of the movies. That's not the case. Trained tuners know this. The sound effects recording people aren't usually on set when we're actually filming a movie. In fact, they usually operate entirely, entirely on their own and completely independently. In fact, I only witnessed one time that any sounds of any of the cars were recorded on set and that was when they used my Maxima for the burnout scene at the barbecue. I'll talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> It's also important to note that we did not record cars with stock engines because that would have made for crummy results. No one wants to listen to a stock Honda. The sound certainly isn't impressive and just it had, had no place in a movie like this. Recording the sounds of some of the cars we used in the first movie wasn't the best way to do this because of the fact that so many of the cars were actually just stock engines or had very few mods. So we had to come up with another idea. Of course, there were a few cars in the movie, in the first movie, that did have impressive sounding engine setups, and a few were indeed recorded, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But for cars like the Supra, the RX-7, my Maxima, my GTR, and Too Fast, Too Furious, the sound design people, even though they like the sound recordings, they're still going to want to add their own stylings to the, base, to the baseline recordings, and I will talk about that process as well. Of course, hardcore tuners and engine builders and educated enthusiasts can all tell the difference between an RB26 and a 13B rotary, just as they can tell the difference between a 2JZ and a V8 M3. We know this stuff. We've been around cars for a long time. So the next logical question then becomes, why don't they just use actual recordings of the real cars if the real cars have modified engines? This is because the sound design people who work on movies are artists, just like the actors. Once they're hired, they want to make a big impact and add their style to the sound effects, and that's just the way it goes. It's important to note here that we're talking about two different sound production needs, what is needed to produce the sounds in a movie. First thing we're going to talk about is sound effects. The second thing we're going to talk about is something called Foley. So basically, anything on screen that is done by human beings is Foley. Those sounds are done through the Foley group. Anything that happens with human, without human action or as a result of human action is considered sound effects. For example, I put the key in the ignition, rotate it, and the car turns on. In this scene, putting in the keys and, rotate, and the rotating sound is Foley, but the sounds of the engine actually starting up is considered sound effects. Does that make it a little easier? Things like walking in the snow, leaves falling, rain and wind, and th those kind of sound effects are considered part of the Foley's responsibility. Gunshots, explosion, and burnouts are all special effects. You starting to get the picture? Of course, the directors and producers have input, but ultimately, what is used to create certain sounds is really determined by the Foley artists and the sound design teams. Generally speaking, directors and producers are more focused not on how the sounds were made, but whether or not they like the actual results. In the first movie, for example, the company in charge of sound design was a company called Soundstorm, and they had been known for doing sound effects for many years. 
The supervising sound editor from the original movie was a fellow by the name of Bruce Stambler, and Bruce knows cars. He assembled a top-notch team of recordists and started recording extensive car libraries of a huge number of exotic and tuner cars. Every main car in the movie was researched and a suitable sound alike is, was found. This is where I came in. My job was to organize the cars that were going to be recorded and so I was personally on site when we did many of the recordings for the cars for the first movie. Recording sessions actually continued on throughout the post-production process. As a matter of fact, the movie had already been filmed and we were well into the post-production process. These sound recordings were done at Aguadulce Airport, which was about an hour north of LA, set up in the hills and a Little Canyon. The runway there was about 4,600 feet long and had one small group of hangars at the southeast apron area. These red buildings that you see here did not exist in 2001. It was a cold day in February of 2001, just four months before the movie was due to be released. I'm kind of talking about the first movie. The cars we had in si on site included my orange Supra, my supercharged Maxima, John Lapid's Green Eclipse, one of the clone RX-7s, which had a fully stock motor, a Ford Lightning, a Turbo Integra, and a black automatic twin-turbo Mark IV Supra, and a handful of other cars, including a couple of race cars. The process of gathering sound clips required us to dry the cars in several ways, including revs, burnouts, um, slow driveaways, uh, moderate speed driveaways, full speed driveaways, pull up and come to a stop at normal, pull up and come to a stop aggressive, uh, medium speed flybys, low speed flybys, high speed flybys, full throttle quarter mile pet poles, uh, clutch drops, running through the gears, accelerating, running through the gears, decelerating. And the runway is less than a mile long, so my Super hit about 140 miles an hour before I had to get on the binders. And we had to do this about 50 times because I made 50 different runs with this car at least. The recordings were made by installing several microphones inside and outside the cars. In fact, we had a, on my Super, for example, we had one under the hood right next to the blow-off valve. We had one on the dash. We had one in the center console. We had one in the rear hatch area. And we had another one covered with uh, foam right next to the, the exhaust pipe. The one up by the blow-off valve was just inches from the blow-off valve. All those sounds would have to be blended together. And then last but not least, we had a guy standing in the middle of the runway with one of those big radar-looking dishes. It's called a, para a parabolic mic dish and he would aim that dish at you as your car came by and all that kind of stuff to catch the flybys. And that's how that went then. The sound recording guy actually rode shotgun inside the car, inside the cars with two digital audio tape machines uh, on his lap. Unfortunately, this was a recipe for motion sickness and the poor guy struggled with that early in the day. In turn, each of the cars would do startups, revs, launches, slow drive-bys, fast drive-bys, burnouts, U-turns, and so forth. As I said, about 50 different sound clips were recorded from each car. Watching this process of them recording the sounds was absolutely incredible. They recorded everything you could think of, including things like us driving on pavement with a little gravel or sand present, gear changes, uh, backing up, all that kind of stuff. One thing I remember very clearly, at one point during the filming session, well, let me lay the groundwork here. Agua Dulce Airport is up in a dark canyon. We did the recording in February, so the days were cold and the days were very short, and by 5 p.m. it was almost dark, and by dark I mean pitch black. A group of coyotes had gathered somewhere around the apron, just on the hillside, just as we were getting the cars packed up to leave. Instead of the, the sound guy uh, walking away, he kind of focused in on one coyote who was probably 100 feet away, and rather than running away, he rip, whipped out that parabolic microphone dish and started walking closer to the coyote. He recorded the sounds of that coyote barking and yelping for a good 10 minutes. That guy had balls. But in my mind, since we couldn't see more than 25 feet or so, all I can think is that, that we were being sounded by a pack of coyotes. Now you may be asking yourself, why in the hell would a sound guy who's there to record car sounds record a, bu a bunch of coyotes yelping for this car moving? I found out later when I saw the first rough cut move of the movie about two months later. If you watch the scene where Brian is at that house with the pool talking to his cop boss, it's a nighttime scene. If you listen carefully, you can hear the actual recording of that actual coyote in the background soundtrack. There's all kinds of family, Brian. And that's a choice you're gonna have to make. And I recognized it immediately because I was literally standing there when it was recorded. 
Anyway, once the sounds were recorded, it was time to get back to the studio where the sounds were going to be mixed. And if you guys follow DJs or anything, you have a, probably a basic idea of what that entails. Mixing sound is probably every you th if everything you thought it was. It's the processing of or the process of laying tracks and then adding effects to the tracks. This is the job of the sound mixers and editors, and is done on every movie. All the car sounds were edited by Soundstorm editors using something called the Fostex Foundation 2000 system. Imagine having only eight tracks available at one time because that was the limitation back then. You people who are in the sound industry know what you can do now. The interface consisted of a very small touch screen. That was basically it compared with today. The Fostex Foundation System 2000 system was a high-end digital audio work workstation that the company Fostex introduced in 1993 and I think it was about $65,000 back then. Bruce's task on the movie were, pri were pri the primarily traditional sound design moments. That included CGI point of view shots, flying inside of an engine, all the high tech nitrous activations and the associated power surges, some slow motion scenes, the wind effects and all that kind of stuff, fly, fast car flyby sweeteners, which I'll talk about in a minute, and most importantly, doing the sounds that would create a sense of speed. Bruce and his team also planned for, planned for a layer of animal sweeteners for the cars. A sweetener basically is any sound file that is laid into the soundtrack to sweeten the sound and can often include industrial sweeteners, animal sweeteners, or any number of things. In this case, when I say animal sweeteners, what I mean is that you might hear roars or growls of any number of animals, tigers, lions, bears, whatever, all of that is layered into the soundtrack. Obviously you can't hear one growling, but it's layered in there. The sound design workload was already heavy, so they brought in a dude by the name of Charles Deenan to take over that enormous task. He delivered some spectacular tracks that added a whole new level of ferocity to what was already an outrageously aggressive car uh, movie. And they split it up. The, they split up the sound design pre-dubs like this. DSNA was the animal sweeteners and day and night transitions. That was Charles's assignment. DSNB were the design effects for the nitrous spraying, the title graphics flying in, whooshes and all that. DSNC was car sweeteners like pre-pan flybys, tires, and engines, and the DSND was uh, interior car wind noise and sense of speed effects. Each movie character was represented by a different set of sound design style. The unique sounds highlighted the different cars from shot to shot to help the audience keep track of the characters. It also supported and reflected each of the person's character traits and personality. It's a big order. The nitrous shots, like everything else in the movie, were larger than life events, if you remember. They were just over the top. The inside the engine shots were visually very dense. These all required very detailed work to convey such sonic complexity in such a very short time. So the way Bruce did it was, he had little bits of sound follow each other in a sequence rather than having too many sounds happening and being laid on top of, layered on top of one another. It was amazing to watch. Bruce said that he spent about a week or so on the first eight second trip through Dom's engine, the part where he's doing the drag racing. He said that, that piece, uh, that he, he basically said that he used short pieces of what he called evocative sounds, fiery explosions, air blasts, and spinning mechanical sounds and so forth. For example, the camshaft spins were created from an old slide projector sound effect. Remember those old slide projectors? The engine by sound included a close-up engine recording of his own personal car, which was a piece of shit Buick Sky, Skyhawk that he was sending to the junkyard. The car had a bad alternator and a bad tensioner. So those sounds were recorded and modified for use in the Do, uh, Dom's engine starting getting, getting ready to explode. Now that you understand some of the process, let's get down to understanding what engines were used to provide the sounds for the cars in the first movie. For my Supra, the sounds were nearly identical to my actual Supra, and if you're in interested, I can prove it. How can I prove it? Good question. While preparing for this video, I found the original sound files, the ones we actually recorded on the runway from many of the cars from the first movie. These files, years ago, were uploaded to an audio library by the original sound production company, Soundstorm. That audio library still exists online today. Links to the sound files, the original sound files, from all the cars from the first movie, all the ones that we recorded in that, that day in that session, are all in high resolution and you can download them. I'm going to post the links in the video description, but just remember that the final sounds in the movies included audio tweaks, all the audio tweaks I'm explaining in this video. But anyway, you'll be able to hear the raw clips 
and then compare that to what you actually hear in the final film by watching YouTube videos of it. And you can see how some were really close and some were really far off and how some were combinations of other things. And so if you have some time, follow the links that are going to be down in my description and poke around for a while. Best part about all of that, you can actually buy the clips and download them. The ones that you're going to preview are low resolution files, so they're not, it's like uh, when you record on iTunes, it's 128 kilobyte, kilobytes per second or whatever, and a CD is like 328 kilobytes per second. So you would be able to buy the sound recordings, you know, little snippets, some of them are 20 seconds, some of them are about six and a half minutes. Um, and once you download them, you can use them for whatever you want to use them for, I suppose and they'll be high res, so. As I said a moment ago, the sounds of some of the cars that you're gonna hear in those sound files sound almost identical to what they sounded like in the movie. A lot of them were heavily edited, and you'll be able to figure that out. Such was the case with my Super and my Maxima. If you listen to the audio clips in the links below this video, you can clearly tell that that is the way my Maxima and Supra actually sounded in real life. With the Eclipse, it was a mix between a Turbo Integra race car and the supercharged CRX of Greg Leone. I suspect that some of the sound came from an Eclipse GSX because we re recorded sounds from that car too on that day. And gear shift change sounds came from the Foley artist, separate thing, who used their own proprietary method to make the sounds. And there were probably a combination of metal and plastic props. We will never know because Foley artists do never share their secrets. For the high civics, a mix of sounds were used, an Acura Integra with a cold air intake and a full header among them. For the Ford Lightning, pretty easy. We actually recorded a Ford Lightning, so I don't think there was much change in the final sound file since you hear very little of the car, that truck actually running. For Dom's Arc 7, ah, that sound file was clearly heavily edited. It sounded like, much like a J one jz is the primary source, but I'm sure a 2JZ with basic bolt-ons was also recorded because we literally had one on set. Uh, on or on the at that runway thing like I mentioned earlier what else was edited in to make the rx7 file I can't say because it's like the it's not like the sound guys would let me peek over their shoulder as they were doing it And I wouldn't understand what I was looking at when they're working on pro tools Anyway, I was a novice with that stuff back then me as integra for example the the bass sound came from the same na natural natural aspirator integra we used for the high civics Letty's 240SX started with the baseline recording my super 2jz can't say what else would edit into the final sound files Dom's Charger, they did use another supercharged Hemi motor in a, that was in another car for the sounds. The sounds may have been tweaked, but to me they all pretty much sound the same as long as you're using full, full exhaust. Different superchargers sometimes sound different than one another, but the sounds were pretty spot on. If you, and then I'm gonna put a link in the video so you can watch another supercharged charger and what it sounds like. Jesse's Jetta, the engine sounds came from a Turbo Integra and an NA Integra, which were basically missed together. No, it wasn't a VR6. The actual motor in Jesse's Jetta was a stock 2.0 liter four cylinder, no turbo, no supercharger. Trans S2000 is a mystery. They, had, they appear to use two different engine sounds in two of the different shots, particularly at Race Wars. Uh, one was clearly a Honda with an exhaust that seemed to be missing its muffler. The other sound clip at Race Wars was masked during the race with the Jetta, so I can't say for sure what they might have used for baseline sounds. Anybody, it's anybody's guess. The scene where Tran meets Ted and pours oil down his throat in the garage seems to come from the actual Hero One car since it was on set. Edwin's Integra was, was recorded from the actual Hero One Integra, which did in fact have a cold air intake and a full header and exhaust. So, can you replicate the sounds for your car? The short answer is maybe, and only for some of the cars. And let me explain. Common sense applies here. If you're driving a Honda Civic and want it to sound like my Super did or one of the GTRs or whatever, it's just not gonna happen, period. Absolutely no way. No point arguing it. Can't be done unless you put a 2JZ swap in your Honda if you're trying to replicate the Super sounds, done. But if you own a Supra and you want it to sound like my old Supra, it can indeed, indeed be done. That's because the final sound files of my car, my Supra, sound almost identical to what the real car sounded like. At that point, it just becomes a, a question of buying the same parts. Same with the Maxima. If you go buy a 1999 Maxima and put a Vortex supercharger on it and run the exhaust out of the rear quarter panel, it would sound virtually identical to how my Maxima sounded in the movie. Pretty easy, because it was done mechanically. Replicating the sounds of many of the cars just simply wouldn't be possible, because some of the cars you saw in the movies use sound recordings from other cars. So how do you put, make a WRX sound like an Eclipse or vice versa? Can't be done. 
As I mentioned before, Dom's Arc 7 was a combination of sounds from a 2JZ, some 1JZ, and heavily edited sound effects layered into the final sound, sound file. So no matter what you do with your Arc 7, it's never going to sound like Dom's Arc 7 in the movie. So you can give up on that and move on. In Too Fast, Too Furious, lots of things actually changed. For starters, a whole new production team and sound design team was brought in. So they were going to apply their own styles. What was consistent is that the sounds were heavily edited. Shocker. People usually ask about Brian's GTR, his Evo, and then Roman's Eclipse. Those are the three cars I get asked about the sounds most of all. I wasn't involved much with the sound editing for this movie at all. I do know that one of the cars recorded for the sound file of my GTR was an RB25 equipped Skyline R33 GTST. If you listen to the sounds from the movie car, from my GTR, it sounds like a mix of a single turbo RB25 or RB30, but with bigger cams, possibly. It doesn't matter though, because we know that the sounds were heavily edited. But personally, I've listened to sound files from RB25s and RB30s, and I figured that you could probably get very close if you used either the RB25 or RB30, used a big single turbo and a straight through exhaust with a muffler, and maybe added some HKS cams for good measure. I think that would get you really close, or close enough. As for Brian's Evo, the sounds were based off of an Acura Integra, but the blow-off valves were added from other cars. I, don't, I can't say which ones because I just don't know. Roman's Eclipse seemed to use a Subaru WRS as, as its base sound file. That seemed to be pretty clear. What else was mixed in, I have no idea. But again, both of the sounds of these cars were heavily edited in post-production. So I'm going to try to replicate that. It's going to be hard. And so it went. All the cars in Too Fast, Too Furious either use slightly modified engines or a mix of engine cars from other, or engine sounds from other cars. While some of these cars sounded pretty spot on in what, the, what they would sound like in real life, others were clearly out of place and they were just phoning it in at that point. Different sound team, what can I tell you? I can't comment much on the sounds of cars in the later Fast and Furious movies, mainly because I simply wasn't there. I wasn't on set, I wasn't in the post-production process beyond Tokyo Drift, and so it's a mystery. But it is safe to say that with each production company, there's probably a new sound design company which means a whole new direction for the sound editing or building upon what the previous sound editing team did before. It was only in the first movie where the director, Rob Cohen, was adamant about capturing the right sounds for each car. He wanted a level of authenticity. The sound design teams then added their flair and made it more memorable in my opinion. This is what separates the first movie from the rest, the sounds. In my opinion, Rob's hands-on approach made the first movie the most authentic of any of the movies in the franchise. I remember watching Fast 4. Dom's Buick Grand National sounded nothing like an actual Grand National, and they were dubbing in sounds from a V8 and a manual transmission car. I was very, that was very apparent right out of the gate. Any idiot knows that the whole appeal of a Grand National is its V6 turbo engine, put a big single on it, we want to hear the turbo spool up that kind of thing. It was immediately clear to me that authenticity no longer meant anything to the franchise and I remember leaving the theater saying they were heading away from being movies for car guys and I, it kind of set the tone for what came next. I certainly was right about that but I was also wrong to assume that audiences would give a shit because each movie has made more money than the last so authenticity apparently doesn't mean anything to these audiences. Here in 2020 I've learned one thing from all of this. I was wrong and Universal is right. Universal knows how to sell movie tickets. Action movies sell movie tickets. 15 second dra uh, Honda's drag racing don't sell movie tickets. Not then. But I hope Universal remembers to pay homage to the Vans. We started it all by tossing us a bone by at least using the right engine recordings for the cars in the upcoming, movie, upcoming movies. I hope they will. I can't say for sure. But if they could just keep your physics defying stunts and over-the-top CG animation for yourselves, and for Christ's sake, just give us accurate depictions of the engine sounds, at least give us that. Toss us a freaking bone, right? Ugh, all right got that off my chest anyway thanks for watching this episode please share this video if you like the content hit like if you have a comment that's constructive criticism please go ahead and leave your comment below have a great day be safe